Good afternoon. So today we will continue where we started on Tuesday, and that is discussion on the role of data and decision making in digital businesses. On Tuesday we could see that data is one of the, of course now it's becoming very important uh, input to decision making when it comes to management of uh, businesses and digital businesses in, in, in particular. And we could see the link between uh, data and decision making through generation of information, knowledge, which eventually we can use it for making uh, decisions. So this is what we discussed uh, last time. And we saw that before the widespread of personal computers and the internet and the web technology, we could produce very little uh, data. But following the introduction of these uh, technologies, the world has witnessed and precedented amounts of uh, data. So to, today we have a, a huge data explo uh, explosion coming from different uh, sources and we are all in one way or another participating and uh, we, we participate in generation of this uh, huge amount of data. We could see also a hint from uh, IBM report in 2012 which said about 90% of the data that we, we had uh, then, of course, now that percent could be even higher, was generated, generated in the last two uh, years. We also uh, went on to, to look at different uh, ways through which companies benefit from uh, big data. So we discussed uh, different uh, benefits that companies uh, accrue, be it uh, creation of new revenue streams, finding new ways to engage uh, customers, and, other many, uh, and many other uh, benefits. And also we, we saw that this massive amount of uh, data, which uh, are commonly known as uh, the big data, which we discussed uh, last time, is uh, highly becoming uh, popular as reflected uh, in its coverage in the media and how uh, businesses uh, show interest uh, in big data. Now, from that discussion, someone could have an impression that it's very easy uh, uh, to, to take advantage of this uh, big data. But the truth is, it's not. When people talk about uh, finding new ways to engage with customers through uh, big data, understanding your customer's uh, behavior from uh, big data, it sounds easy. But actually, it's not a walk in the park. This is uh, a survey which was uh, conducted uh, last year. And out of 99% uh, of uh, business executives uh, who consider big data as one of the uh, new sources of competitive advantage, 75% actually found it or they find it difficult to make decisions around data and analytics. And we will discuss today challenges of that. So despite the fact that many people, many companies appreciate the role of uh, big data, still there are a number of challenges that you need to be aware of. And these challenges, first and foremost, uh, around the characteristics uh, of uh, big data. We, we discussed last time the, uh, the different characteristics of uh, big data, that the volume, that the data comes in large quantity, it comes in different uh, varieties, in different shapes, photos, text, uh, audio, and so on. And also we, we, we saw that it comes at a high speed and it's very uh, uncertain. In, 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 in the way that uh, the, the data, some of it is structured and some of it is unstructured. And all this pose some challenges. The first challenge is uh, to identify and capture data. As I said, you, we have a huge amount of data today, but which one is useful for your business? And how can you capture it? That's a big challenge still to, to, to most uh, businesses. So being able to dive into this massive amount of data and capture the right data for your business that can translate into information and eventually 
knowledge relevant for decision making can be quite challenging. And many companies still uh, find that challenges. Of course, later we'll talk about uh, approaches to overcoming these uh, challenges. Another challenge is ali uh, aligning data from different sources. As I say, this data comes from a variety of sources. It comes in different shapes. Now, making sense out of this uh, data can be quite challenging. Say, combining uh, data that you obtain through, for instance, uh, photos, combining with, uh, say, posts of uh, your uh, audience uh, in, in social media platforms, your sales data, combining all this together to make sense out of it can be quite uh, challenging. Another challenge is to transform the data into a, formal, uh, into a form that is suitable for analysis. If any one of you has ever done uh, uh, a survey or you have done a task in research uh, methodology, you will agree with me that although that task was small, after collecting the data, usually you cannot analyze it the way it is. You will have a lot of trouble from the data. Some people will not respond all the questions. And when you, you begin to analyze uh, the data, some of it might be out of range that some people may have completely unique uh, responses that do not match with the rest of the uh, data. So you have problems like missing values, you have uh, outliers, that data that are out of range. And you need to prepare this data before you can uh, analyze. And at least from my experience of data analysis, it takes much more time to prepare data for analysis than doing the analysis itself. Because usually the analysis is it's an approach that we already know. But when it comes to preparing uh, data, it takes a lot of time. And most uh, organizations, even today, they say they spend about 70% of the time in, uh, of analysis, analyzing data and just preparing the data. And then another challenge is uh, to model uh, the, the, the data, whether it's um, mathematically or through some form of uh, simulation. Modeling, put it in very uh, simple uh, terms, usually when we obtain uh, data, we want the data to tell us a story. Basically, we want to use this data to understand the phenomena so that we can predict for the future. And you can do that only by being able to build a model out of the data that you have uh, obtained. So when I talk about uh, model, I guess you all know what a model is. But you can think about, uh, say, what we know, the relationship between demand and price. So this is uh, a model, it's a standard model that has been established as a result of observations that we have observed many uh, data points and eventually we came up with the fact that there is a relationship between demand and price in a way that when the price goes higher, the demand will decline. So this is an, an example for a model. In the same way, we want to use this, uh, the data we obtain to create a model. Let me take this. So, suppose you have something like this. Uh, this is time. This is value. Uh, say one, two, uh, four, eight, so, uh, um, uh, 16. Now, imagine that this is what we have observed, that when time is zero, the value is one. When time is one, the value is two. When time is three, the value is four. When time is, uh, say, four, the value is 16. When time is five, the value is 32. If somebody is asking you, can you guess what will be the value when time is 10? Can you do that from this? It's 100? How?
yeah, that there is a pattern on this. And this could be that every time there is, like, if n is equal to 0, but any number power 0 is equal to 1. If n is equal to 1, then it's 2 power 1, 2. n is equal to 2, it's 2 power 2 is equal to 4. n is equal to 3, is 2 power 3, 16. n is equal to 5, is 2 power 5, 32. Which means we now know what the pattern is. And we can use it to predict what happens if t is, uh, n is equal to 10. In this case, it will be 2 power 10 will be this one. And this is what we do with data, that we use data to establish patterns. Like when customers manifest this kind of behavior, what will happen? And this is based on the big number of observations that we, we have made. And based on that, we can predict future behavior of uh, customers. Now, this is a very simple example. When data is structured uh, as, as this one, it's easy to develop uh, models that you can crunch the numbers and come up with a model that predicts what will be the future values. But when the data comes in a huge volume and in different shapes, it can be quite demanding to be able to arrive into such a function, that a function that can help you predict future values of a particular uh, phenomenon. So this is one of the challenges that uh, companies are facing. We, we will talk about the solutions uh, later. And then another challenge is to understand the output. You may be able to process uh, the, the data, but to present it in a way that is understandable can be quite challenging. In an organization, not everyone is uh, knowledgeable with uh, mathematics or programming and those kind of things. Then you need to have this data presented in a way that can convince the users in an organization. Now, that also is another uh, challenge. So th in this image, I, uh, I just try to show the gap between the raw data and final output. What we see in the newspapers, in the reports, is something like this. But it takes a, a lot of work to come from raw data to the final output. Now, when you are doing your standard uh, uh, statistical analysis, usually, usually the data is structured as this. You are working with data frames, data arranged in tables, and you can easily analyze. But when it comes to unstructured data, that is quite challenging. So basically, there is a gap currently that between the ability businesses have to analyze this uh, uh, massive amount of data that we generate every day compared to what the data can provide. And this is what most organizations are working on. They're, they are striving to close this gap. And of course, thanks to the technologies that are evolving every day, this gap keeps on closing. We'll see it uh, later uh, uh, when I discuss about solutions. Another challenge that uh, companies uh, say that they have today with respect to big data is a shortage of data scientists. People with skills to do this kind of analysis are few, at least according to surveys uh, data and according to what companies say. This is uh, a study by McKinsey. This is one of the very reputable uh, management consulting firm. And they say by 2020 there will be a shortage of 1 million uh, data smart managers and 100,000 data scientists. And you need to mark these numbers because, as I said on, on Tuesday, that businesses today are data driven. The business landscape has changed, and competitive advantage today will base on how you can utilize data to outcompete your, your rivals. So it's not just about having people that can analyze the data, but also you need to have managers in your organization that are taking various decisions who can understand uh, the, the output that is given by these uh, people. And there is a huge uh, concern about this shortage of uh, data scientists. 
So you have it in, in newspaper, uh, in media, where business leaders are talking about uh, shortage of uh, data scientists or people with right skills uh, to take advantage of the uh, massive data that w uh, we have. And because of that, there are so many people. Uh, this statement or originally was made by Al Varen. He is the chief economist of uh, Google. He said, data scientists, this is uh, it's going to be the sexiest job of the 21st century, given the demand that is uh, available today. If data analytics is, uh, is going to be uh, the base of co uh, competitive advantage, then obviously these people are going to be very uh, valuable. Now, why is it challenging to, to have uh, data scientists? Why do we have a shortage of data scientists? The truth of the matter is, to be able to take advantage, to, to carry out this uh, analysis and pro produce relevant results that are expected from uh, big data, you need an hybrid of skills and knowledge that today not so many universities offer. That the kind of combination that people uh, with uh, uh, data analysis capability or big data analysis capability are required to have is quite diverse. With, different, with integration of uh, knowledge from different uh, fields, which is uh, quite dynamic. And this guy is one of the uh, business leaders, and he was asked about uh, what kind of skills people need. So he said it's, uh, you, the, I, he thinks you need to have a combination of uh, statistical analysis knowledge, mathematics, predictive modeling, and in this case, we are talking about ability to program, to, to code. And of course, you need to have business intuition. So it's a combination of skills that most degree programs. Of course, now there are so many universities that are taking uh, uh, initiatives to, to create programs that are directly relevant for big data, but uh, big data analysis and uh, taking advantage of this amount, a massive amount of uh, uh, data. But the good news is, if you're interested either to be a data scientist or at least to be a smart data uh, consumer, there are so many ways around. You can do it yourself. Of course, most of these courses, uh, as I've said, are also offered even in, at a school like this, which means you can try to create your own package by choosing courses that can help you uh, do this kind of analysis, but also there are so many uh, online platforms where you can learn this. One of my recommendations, I've done it myself, is uh, a Coursera course on the data scientist uh, toolbox. This is a package of about eight uh, courses where you learn a little bit of programming, they will teach you uh, statistics, data mining, I'll, I'll talk to you later what data mining is. So it's a, a full package that can give you uh, a very good head start of to, to this uh, uh, field of uh, 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 data scientists, uh, data analysis, uh, big data analysis. Another uh, challenge, of course, uh, companies are facing is uh, privacy and security, and this is very uh, obvious that uh, although there is so much uh, wealth uh, hidden in, in data. Sometimes we have to be careful when it comes to exploiting, to, to like digging into this data. Some, it contains sensitive information and you cannot use it just uh, anyhow. Yeah. I was talking to one of my, my, my uh, roommates and we were discussing, I, I received an email from a company yesterday and I don't remember to have subscribed to to, to, to their service, but they seem to know a lot of, uh, about me. So they were suggesting things and they will say, but this is too much. I feel like someone is out there watching me, right? And this is true to most uh, consumers. So although you can take advantage of so much information that you collect from your customers, you need to be careful because customers may not be very, very happy knowing too much about them. Now, with all these challenges uh, we, we have talked about, the huge volume, the variety, and the difficulties of uh, an analyzing big data, it's important that we have to consider the various uh, 
technologies and, and solutions that uh, can help us analyze. And this is what, uh, one of the approaches that you can look at, that we need to consider the, vari the various software platform because it's true that the uh, ordinary computers that we, we, we have today cannot handle this amount of, uh, large amount of uh, data. So you need to have a, a software uh, a platform that can help you to store and process uh, this data, but also we will talk about uh, uh, data machine uh, learning. And also you need to have uh, solutions. Uh, and this, here we are talking about predictive models, that ability to create models from the data that we, uh, we analyze. Now we'll discuss about this. One of the software platform that today is very popular is Hadoop. And this is a, a framework that allows you to store and process uh, big data in a distributed fashion on a large number of uh, uh, computers, or put it in other words, across multiple uh, servers. By a framework, it means that it's a platform that provides you with all the tools and possibilities relevant for anal analyzing your data. It's distributed in the sense that you, the data is stored across multiple uh, computers. So you have uh, data from different uh, sources, whether it's social media, your own system, and other sources. And these can be stored across multiple uh, servers. And it provides massive uh, storage. It can take a huge amount of data and provides uh, ability to process faster than what an ordinary uh, system w would do. Now, I just mentioned a little bit about uh, predictive uh, models, so I would talk a little bit more about it then. So as I said here, in the end, we want to learn from uh, the data and get a, a pattern of what the data tells us. And from this pattern, we can predict uh, what the future would be like for a particular phenomenon. So for instance, in this case, you can collect data about your products and services that are, you, you sell, how customers buy their social media uh, behaviors, your customer feedback. All these are examples of data. Now, from this, as we did here, like we, we have data points, you create a predictive model. So for instance, based on this, a model can tell you if you launch a new product with these features, who is likely to, to purchase out of these customers that you are saving today. And this is the uh, essence of predictive modeling, that being able to understand patterns from the data we have and use these uh, patterns to predict, say, for instance, future be behavior of your customers. And that's why uh, in that article I referred to on uh, Tuesday uh, from Forbes, they say, finally, capitalists have obtain what they have been looking for for many years. And that is to be able to predict the behavior of a customer. Because if you can do that, it means you can sell anything. As long as I understand how someone will act, it means it's easy to just create, a, build a product that will suit that potential behavior. So this is what about predictive modeling. But as I said, it's very difficult when the data that we're working on is unstructured and in, in huge volume, which means a human brain can handle simple data like this. But when it becomes complex, it becomes beyond our ability to do that. And that's why we need machine learning. And what this uh, does is, is to teach a computer, basically, to read from data and create algorithms or build these predictive models. So instead of doing it uh, ourselves, the computer does it uh, for us. And that's what uh, we call machine learning. And it can, it can process this huge amount of uh, uh, data and come up with predictive models that we can use. Now, 
today there are so many uh, solutions that are available in the, in, in the market. Uh, predictive analytics uh, solutions. Many companies are offering this. Of course, IBM and SAS are uh, leading in the game, but there are so many uh, alternatives. And what they are doing is to provide you with tools that can help you do this, uh, that is creating models that can help you predict particular uh, phenomena. So whether it's, uh, say, an insurance uh, company that wants to create a risk uh, model and tell exactly maybe which customer is likely to uh, default or manifest uh, uh, unusual uh, behavior or which customer is a high risk uh, customer, this can uh, help you do that. Actually, you, you can even, uh, there are tools that can allow even police officers to predict a, a crime scene uh, in a particular geographical area. So the range of uh, phenomena that can be predicted using these tools are quite uh, wide and uh, as technologies evolve, the applications uh, get, keep on getting even uh, wider. So if at some point you would, you would also like to explore, say for your business or for company that you work for, these are some of the companies that today provide these solutions. Of course, as of today, this is a list from April, but many companies are getting into this uh, industry. So probably there will be more uh, companies offering uh, the same services. Now, next to that, I will uh, get to the next topic, and that is optimization of uh, digital business services. Now, as you can recall, in the beginning we, we, of, of this uh, uh, class, or in the beginning of the semester, we say that companies adapt digital technologies in order to enhance efficiency and effectiveness of their uh, operations. So you, you use, we take these uh, technologies to enhance efficiency and uh, uh, effectiveness of the operations we are, we, we are doing. Now, optimization of a uh, digital business is actually about improvement of effectiveness and efficiency of a digital business in a continuous fashion. Because this is not a, uh, a, a one-shot uh, event. It's something that has to be continuous. Because the business uh, environment it keeps on changing, which means you always have to take measures to ensure that your business is effective and efficient. And this is an ongoing uh, process. So optimization is all about that. Now, there are key questions uh, that you need to ask yourself with respect to service effectiveness and efficiency. With regard to effectiveness, as this uh, summarizes the definition of the two or the distinction between efficiency and effectiveness, efficiency is doing things right, while the effectiveness is doing the right things. That effectiveness is about reaching the goals that you have uh, say, and efficiency is how do you reach those goals. So with regard to effectiveness, you should ask yourself whether the service is meeting your business goals, whether the experience and service uh, delivered is satisfactory to your users, and whether new technology, the technology approaches or information are available that could improve that experience. On the other hand, service efficiency is about questions, two main questions, and that is whether the operation of the system measured through speed of, of response, usability, and cost are appropriate to lead to an e effective service. So here we are talking about the inputs that we, uh, we inject into the system. And or whether there is a, a technology that is uh, appropriate for improving efficiency of the system. Now, in this class, we will focus on two aspects. First is content uh, management of your site or website. And also, we will talk about web analytics. 
And these are key factors uh, when it comes to insurance, uh, ensuring effectiveness uh, of your uh, business. Now, before we, we, we embark into discussion of uh, web, con uh, web content uh, uh, management and web analytics, I will talk briefly about general uh, approach to ac acquiring digital business systems. That at some point, if you choose to go digital, then you will require systems that are needed for executing of all these processes and activities that have to be digitized. Now, there are different approaches that you can use for acquisition of these uh, systems. And we have four main approaches. The first one is uh, bespoke development. And in this case, a system is developed from the scratch, either within your own organization, or you can hire uh, an external uh, firm for, for that purpose. But another approach is uh, of the shelf approach, whereby a complete a standard existing system is uh, built. So in this case, you, a system is not built uh, from the scratch, but rather you are buying a system that is already done, and we are used to that. We, most of us are used to buying uh, off the shelf uh, software or other systems. But another approach is uh, hosted software as a service. We discussed this uh, earlier uh, in the beginning of this semester, software as a service uh, solution, where you use a standard uh, system, but this is not hosted within your uh, org uh, organization. A third part uh, would provide it for you. But another uh, approach is uh, tailored uh, development. So in this case, a system could be either off the shelf or uh, software as a service, but it's customized to, to meet your uh, needs, to meet the needs of your organizations or your business or for whatever purpose that uh, you, you would like to apply it uh, for. Now, which one is common among these uh, four approaches? Based on uh, uh, surveys that have been uh, conducted, it appears that the most uh, uh, common uh, 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 approach is to use tailored off-the-shelf or hosted uh, approach. In this case, off-the-shelf uh, off uh, uh, software is uh, purchased, but it's tailored according to the needs uh, of a particular organization. Now, there are criteria that you need to consider. Regardless of which approach uh, you use uh, to acquire a system, there are a number of criteria that you, used, uh, you are expected to consider when it comes to uh, purchase of a uh, new digital system. And the first one is functionality. And this is very uh, intuitive, that you have to buy something that works. So this is first and foremost, uh, consideration that the system that you, 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 you buy or you, you acquire should deliver the, the purpose for which it's uh, acquired. But also, it has to be easy uh, to, to use. If uh, a system is difficult for uh, users uh, uh, to use, we talked about uh, usability in, in the previous, uh, I think, uh, not the last lecture, but the other one. And that applies to, to, uh, to systems, that you have to have a, a system that is, can be used by you, uh, the, the intended users. And then you have to consider uh, performance. And with this case, we are talking about uh, speed. And for instance, uh, the amount of time that someone has uh, uh, to wait uh, before uh, the, a particular function is uh, executed. So you, you need to, con uh, to make sure that the speed uh, that delivered by the system is satisfactory. Scalability, and this has to do with the uh, ability of the system to acquire bigger load as your business grows, because we expect that your business will continue to grow, and this system is, should be able to adapt to the growth of your uh, business. So whether it's uh, accommodating 
uh, the bigger amount of data that you will be processed, the system has to have that uh, uh, capability to adapt to the growth. Another uh, aspect that you need to consider is compatibility. Usually, it's impossible to, 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 it's all difficult to have a system that delivers all the needs of an organization. So sometimes you will have uh, different systems for different purposes. Then computer, uh, compatibility of these systems is very uh, important fact that you need to consider that a system should be able uh, to integrate with other uh, applications or so other systems with, that are used within uh, your organization. And then you have uh, extensibility and this is uh, related to uh, scalability. That is, it should be able to add, for instance, new model, uh, models on the system that you have uh, uh, acquired to make it uh, extensive. And then you have to have uh, stability, and this is uh, it's concerned with uh, bugs or errors. The, the system should have as fewer errors uh, as possible. Almost every system can have some errors at some point, but you have to make sure that you, you acquire a system uh, that has the fewest errors possible. And then security, that they should it be easily for, uh, easy for uh, unintended users to, to get into this uh, system and do whatever they, they want. So you have to have a, to acquire a system that has appropriate uh, security uh, measures. And then you have to consider uh, support that after acquiring the, uh, the system, it should be possible to get support from the, the vendors. Sometimes you could buy a cheap uh, system from a smaller company and all of a sudden the company uh, dies and you, you, it becomes difficult to get support. And that's one of the arguments that people advise to buy uh, solutions from well-established uh, companies. So it's very important to consider uh, availability of uh, support. Now we will look at uh, uh, content uh, management systems. And this is about management of your website, that it's very important that you keep on updating your website because your website is not a, a printout uh, collateral that can stay as it is all the time. It's very important that you update the content of your uh, website and experience shows that uh, websites that are frequently updated tend to receive more visits than those that are uh, dormant. But besides that, updating your website frequently helps you to increase the visibility of your site on the, uh, uh, by search engines. But we know that not everyone in your organization is a programmer, which means uh, it may be difficult for everyone to update uh, the website if the procedure for doing that is cumbersome or complex. So we need to have systems that can make it easier even for non-programmers uh, to update the, 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 the system, uh, the website. And that's where content management systems come into the frame. That these allow, make it easy for non-specialists to, to, to update uh, uh, the website. So it's something that you need to consider. And there are numerous uh, types of, 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 of available content management system. Some of these are free and some of these are, uh, some of them are enterprise, but free uh, solutions are performing quite well. And there are so many reputable organizations that are using uh, free content management uh, uh, systems. Now, basically, usually this could come in three forms that it could be off the shelf, and that is a, a standard uh, content management system that is already done, and you, you can just acquire it and use it. But uh, also, it could be uh, a, an open source, WordPress, uh, Drupal, some of the uh, examples that you don't need to pay for this. But of course, they provide some, they will provide the, the, the function at the base level if you by the premium versions, of course, you will benefit uh, more from that. But another approach uh, that you can acquire is uh, through uh, fully custom or acquiring 
uh, a content management system that is tailored to your uh, organization. And many large companies do that. Of course, it's quite expensive to, to have a, a, a content management system that is tailored to your organization. But sometimes programmers uh, provide these services for small businesses, but they use some uh, uh, code libraries uh, to, to reduce uh, the cost. So it's also possible for small businesses to acquire these uh, tailor-made content management systems. Now, there are a number of factors that you need uh, to consider when acquiring a content management uh, system. First of all, as I said, it's uh, very important that you, people, uh, different uh, individuals within your organization can be able to update uh, the websites, uh, even those who ha have no uh, back, uh, programming background. And for that reason, it has to be easy uh, to use, but also you have to have easy authorization uh, system. In that way, you can assign different roles to people within the organization for updating uh, the website, that everyone can take part uh, in that. And this will help uh, a frequent update of the website. Instead of having just one person who does it, if everyone can do it, or if many people can do it within an organization, then that will be uh, an advantage. So you need to have a, a, a system that can save that purpose. But another factor you need to consider is uh, a search engine robot uh, crawl, uh, crawlers should be able uh, to access it, to, or to, 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 to add your, your site into the index. Uh, we discussed this when uh, we talked about search engine optimization, that usually search engines like Google use uh, crawlers, which are used to like, move around uh, the web and identify content which is indexed and this eventually can be identified, uh, identified when people enter search uh, terms. Now you need to have a content management uh, uh, system that can support this so that search engines uh, can identify your, can easily identify your, uh, your website. And then uh, we, when we talked about search engine optimization, we discussed about different uh, ways to increase visibility of your uh, website and we talked about uh, how to like to include uh, how to structure your titles, uh, the subtitles, description text. Now some of, of the content management system may not uh, provide an easy approach to editing these uh, items which are quite relevant for search engine optimization. So you need to have a, a content management system that easily uh, supports uh, that or can easily allows editing of these uh, elements. And then you need to have a content management system that provides uh, different page templates. That is, you are expected your, the different section of your uh, website should be able to display different uh, layouts. It's not common to have a uniform uh, layout across the entire website, which means you need to have a, a system that provides for possibility to have different uh, uh, layouts uh, across uh, the website. And then you need to be able to manage uh, different links wi within your uh, website. And also, as you keep on changing uh, the, website, uh, your, your, the content of your website, it should be able to store the different versions of your, your, your site. And this is what we call uh, versioning, that, that the content management system should allow you uh, to, to, to store or to keep the different versions of your, uh, of your content in a, such a way that you can easily retrieve that. And then another factor is security and access control. Although you would like as many people as possible within the organization to access and be able to update this uh, content, but also there should be some security and access uh, measures because probably it's not a very good idea to have each and everyone in the organization uh, do that. You need to have some control of what goes into the website because the content of, of your website can have serious uh, replication to your business. So it's very important to have a, a content management system that provides for uh, uh, adequate security and access control 
measures. And then you need to have a, a system that allows for use of uh, plugins and widget gates. And these are very important when it comes to connecting your website to say social media uh, platforms or other uh, websites. So it should be possible uh, to, to, to do that. And then it should be possible to track and monitor activities on your website. So this could be uh, being able to track uh, the behavior of the visitors on your uh, website, as well as uh, the, the ability to allow tools such as Google Analytics. We, we'll discuss it later when we talk about um, web analytics. Tools such as this uh, to be able to to track and monitor the, what is going on on your website. And then the last one is navigation and visualization that it should be able for, of course, users to easily uh, navigate and that sh should be a, it should provide an intuitive uh, uh, approach uh, to, to that. It's two o'clock. We should we take a break or because it's not so many slides that should we just continue and then finish earlier? Yeah. Now, after acquiring uh, uh, a digital system, it's very important that we conduct what we call testing because you, even if uh, a vendor or if it's uh, developed from the scratch within an organization, promises uh, certain results, it may not work out as we expect. So it's very important to, to test the new systems that we uh, acquire. Now, testing has to be done in a systematic way, in a structured way. And this is what we are trying to, to learn in, in, in this uh, uh, course. So there could be different types of uh, testing that can be done. Now, the, the first one could be the, the developer uh, test because these uh, systems are based, done based on codes, uh, programming, right? So developer may conduct uh, tests uh, to, to check if uh, the different models of the system they have built uh, works as uh, it should. But also it can be uh, feasibility uh, testing, that is, uh, when the system is about to be uh, launched, we test whether this uh, performs as uh, it should. And then we, we can test uh, uh, modules, that the different modules of the system could be tested individually to see each one of them performs uh, as expected. But after performing uh, module testing, you have also to conduct integration testing where the different uh, modules are tested whether they can work together uh, as expected. And after testing the, uh, the modules, you, we can test for the entire system to see if it delivers uh, the results that we expect. And then you can try to perform a, a transaction, like it, uh, to make a complete activity on, on, uh, on this system. So to try to, to conduct a real uh, a transaction on the system to see whether this transaction will be executed. And of course, finally, we will check for performance and that is uh, checking the, the speed of the steam. So although a, a transaction may be completed uh, to the end, but we also want to make sure that the system is operating at the right uh, speed. And also we have to check for usability and uh, accessibility. So at this point, we bring it to the real users, whether people can comfortably use the system or not. We discussed about usability uh, earlier in this class. And then we, we have to check about accept, uh, acceptance uh, uh, test. That is uh, whether the users will accept this system because eventually, we are building this system or we are acquiring this system for particular users. So we have to make sure that those who are going to use it accept uh, the system. And finally, check the content. In this case, 
say on a website, you have to experiment whether the, uh, the content is uh, produced the results that we want or, or not. So this is kind of a systematic uh, approach that is uh, used. And the reason we are discussing these things, you may not be working directly with this, but at least you need to have a, a, a clue of what, uh, say, people in the IT department of my, or marketing that are involved directly in this, what they are doing. And you should be able to collaborate with them. Another thing that you need to consider is a, a system changeover. Sometimes we, are not, we acquire a new system, not completely uh, from scratch, or put it in other words, a bit, since technology keeps on changing, sometimes you have an old system that you want to get rid of and you want to acquire a new system. Now, you need to have a systematic approach to making this changeover, that is making a migration from the old system to the new system. Now, there are different, uh, uh, different uh, approaches to, to performing, uh, uh, to undertaking migration or to performing uh, changeover. And here are the five uh, approaches that you can consider. And that is, well, the first one is immediate uh, cutover. That is, you go straight from the old system to the new system on a particular uh, day. Of course, it's fast and it's cheap, but could be very high risk that it may involve a serious uh, disruption to your op operations. Another approach is parallel uh, running, whereby the old system is maintained for a while while the new system is maintained, uh, is uh, tested or implemented. So in this case, you, ca you have some time to see how the new system is performing, and at the same time you have a backup of the old system. So it helps you to avoid this uh, uh, disruption of your uh, operations. And in case something goes wrong with the new system, you can quickly uh, switch back to the old system while you are fixing the problem. But another problem, is, another approach is uh, phased implementation, whereby instead of implementing the entire system, uh, you implement certain modules of the system. That, so you, it's a, you take a piecemeal ap approach, a, a component after uh, a component, instead of introducing the entire new system at once. Another approach is pilot uh, system where you try to implement the system before uh, getting it uh, out for the widespread uh, implementation. And another uh, approach is uh, perpetual uh, better, and this is uh, a way of uh, implementing uh, software in, that is kind of keeping it uh, on test, but you keep on watching uh, uh, the system. So you, you launch uh, a software that you know it might have some potential uh, problems, but at the same time, you would like things to move faster. So the, the software will be launched while measures to improve it are, are taken uh, continuously. So you keep on identifying errors and keep on improving your system. Now, after acquiring a system or making a changeover from the old system to another system, to a new system, we need to take appropriate measures to maintain uh, the system that we, we, we have. And in this case, we will focus on maintenance of a, a website. There are two uh, approaches to management of uh, the changes that we are uh, making, and that is whether con making a routine uh, changes, that is continuous uh, daily uh, changes, or major changes that are not done uh, regularly, but once they are done, they are significant. Uh, Changes. An approach to making routine uh, changes is quite simple. This is like a, a systematic uh, approach that you are expected to follow when you are uh, making changes on your website. Because, and the assumption here we are making, and of course this is real, that 
the content of your website is the king in the sense that it can serious uh, repercussions. So you have to be careful each time on whatever you are posting, which means this is with the, we, we, they recommend that we need to have a systematic approach to uh, doing this to make sure that we are doing it error free. So you expect it to, of course, produce the content, write it, and after writing it, review it carefully. Well, sometimes when you're writing, you can make a lot of uh, uh, errors, so you have to make sure that you go through it after writing, make any corrections that are relevant, publish it, and that is in the test environment, publish it, but don't make it available to, to your uh, audience. See it yourself, how it looks like uh, on, on the website and how uh, people can uh, perceive or experience it. Test, like find some individuals that can give you feedback on the content. And then finally, if you are satisfied with all this, you can let it uh, out to the live environment that you can let it for the audience uh, to see. Now, of course, these things are done. You can do it very fast. It's, uh, the process seems uh, long, but it's uh, something that you can do quick. But at least what the uh, framework uh, tells you is how you should approach uh, management of changes on your uh, website. But sometimes you need to have, you can, you, you can embark into major changes. And major changes here, we are referring to things like navigation on your uh, website, change on the structure of your website. These are things that we are not making every day. It's something that happens once in a, in a while. And for that reason, it has to be done much more seriously. And for large companies, usually they have a committee that is responsible for, for that, comprising of different uh, people from different uh, functions of the uh, organization, most likely led by the marketing uh, unit. And these are responsible for defi uh, defining uh, aspects such as uh, dates uh, for making uh, those changes, providing specification of the structure or the navigation that has to be uh, uh, achieved, what kind of tools that should be used, changes to the site standards, making review of the quality after the changes have been uh, achieved, making specification of uh, online promotion and those kind of things. So eventually, the main point here is that you need to have uh, a group of people from different functional areas within your organization that will be responsible for such major changes because such a major change will have serious uh, impact on your uh, business. So it has to be done carefully. And this brings us to uh, the next uh, subtopic, and that is web analytics. Uh, I, I guess you probably have heard a lot of, about web analytics because this is the big news uh, right now among, uh, in the uh, business practice. Now, what a web analytics is all about is about tracking, collecting, and measuring data from the, the, the web for different purposes, usually for marketing uh, uh, purposes. So what web analytics does is to acquire data from uh, uh, the web and use this data uh, uh, to, to get insights of what is going on on your, say, website. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. So basically, what web uh, analytics uh, uh, does, as I said, is to help you uh, get uh, acquire data and make sense out of this data regarding what is happening on your uh, website. Uh, something is wrong with them. Take some time to respond. <laughs> 